going. Um, housekeeping, we're recording this. So um, uh, so just so you know, um, I guess for folks online, if you could keep yourself muted, we'll do questions okay. at the end. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and uh, uh, Emma Albi is monitoring the chat. And uh, But today, we are very lucky to have our own uh, Camilla Syrup, who's going to be doing um, uh, talking about her master's thesis, uh, doing a reprise of that. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'll just I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Look forward to it. Thanks, Abe. Yes, as you all mostly know me. Um, I work the Northeast Temperate Network, uh, part of the Inventory Monitoring Division of the National Park Service. And I did my um, master's project uh, with my advisor, Sean Braver at the University of Maine. Okay, so yeah, thank you all for coming. My presentation is entitled 60 Years of Change in the Red Spruce Forest of Coastal Maine. So just a quick roadmap for the presentation. I'll start with some background on coastal spruce and then the history of the project. Uh, and then I'll get into goals and objectives, the study design, we'll spend a good chunk of time on results, and then I'll finish up with conclusions and future directions. So as most of you probably know, spruce is a cold adapted species whose populations are generally restricted to mountainous or northern parts of northeastern uh, United States or southeastern Canada, um, but it is also found along the main coast um, where it is enabled by the moderating effect of the Gulf of Maine, which ensures cool summers and um, high moisture availability. Um, like most cold adapted species, uh, it's projected to do quite poorly under uh, climate change, um, but there are current signs of vigor. So in the Adirondacks in Vermont, um, red spruce has been moving down elevational gradients. There's also um, reported increases in radial growth in uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and then here in Acadia, we're seeing increase in basal area and seedling abundance. Uh, in addition, uh, there's evidence that the main coast may have served as a refugium in the mid Holocene warming period, where coast persisted, spruce persisted along the coast, but it disappeared from the Um So it's difficult to sort of reconcile these two competing. Um, realities, you know, the projections for future loss and the current vigor, because we really don't have a detailed understanding of coastal spruce forest dynamics in the ground. I'm going to try to get the block in here. Okay. Um, all right. So fortunately, we have a treasure trove of historical data to draw upon. Um, Dr. Earl Davis, who's seen here on the left, Professor Marius at UMaine, um, inventory coastal spruce forests in a landmark study in 1959. He documented the extent of coastal spruce and established inventory plots along the coast. On the right, you can see um, a figure from his 1966 publication of coastal spruce distribution. And specifically, his sites were chosen after extensive reconnaissance um, as examples of the most mature coastal spruce at the time, which was quite rare um, on the landscape in general, a lot of young stamps. So in 2020, Dr. Jay Wason received a second century stewardship fellowship from Spudic Institute to address this knowledge gap in coastal spruce forest dynamics. And so he proposed resampling seven of Dr. Davis's sites, um, that you can see here on the right, uh, and now that's the work that I'll be presenting today. And I want to point out that by relocating and resampling these plots, we're generating a 60 year time series, which is the oldest in coastal species forests. So, the overarching goal of the project was to expand our understanding of long term forest dynamics and mature coastal red spruce stands. We're going to do this with three objectives. Number one was to assess the current structure and composition of the stands. Two was to quantify changes in forest structure and composition of mature coastal spruce forests over the 60 year time period. And three was to reconstruct the disturbance history of each site using dendrochronological methods. 
And so hopefully we'll end up with a detailed understanding of local red spruce forest dynamics and a clear picture of historical change, which should help managers give more context um, for planning climate change. All right, so that's it for sort of your orientation. I'm gonna move into the study design now. So here are the seven study sites again. They're all within the park or under conservation easement, the ironbound site in particular here. Um, I wanna point out the Western Mountain site in particular, which is um, one of the only remaining sites of old growth in the park. And it's very rare, one of two on the coast in general. And by old growth, we are using it, the term as never harvested. Um, so unfortunately, though these sites were not permanently located or permanently marked, so we had to relocate them for this study. But fortunately, Dr. Davis published these hands-on maps of almost all the sites. So this rectangle here is the focal area where he focused all his observations, and that's where we wanted to put our Plots. So I relocated or I geolocated um, the corners in, in ArcGIS, but it's quite rough, you know, they're hand-drawn maps. Um, but fortunately, there were some other indications noted on, on the map. So on this particular site, this is the Beach Mountain site, there was this boulder pointed out. And we thought, well, it's got to be quite distinctive <laughs> for it to make the map. Um, so we went out there, walked around in the general area where we thought it was going to be. And in fact, we did find a very distinctive boulder. And it really, I mean, once we found it, like, oh, this has got to be it. So um, based on, you know, these landmarks that we located and some other things, we found, um, we bought pit traps from the original study. We're really fairly confident that we relocated the sites. Okay, so I'm now gonna talk about our plot layout and the inventory data that we collected. This is another one of the historical maps. Um, this is the Bat Harbor Head site. You can see the lighthouse there. Um, so again, this is that focal area where Dr. Davis um, took most of his observations. It turned out this was a 20 by 200 meter area, so very long and skinny, um, but his data was actually collected in five 10 by 10 meter plots, inventory plots that are somewhere within that focal area, but we don't exactly know where they are. Excuse me. So we decided the best way to sort of maximize the chances of, of sampling the same area was to establish a 10 by 200 meter plot down the center of that focal area. So very long and skinny. It looks a bit like that. Um, here's an inset to scale of the first 30 meters of the plot. Um, so very narrow. I'll use this to sort of describe the data that we collected. So within the full plot, we measured every single tree and we collected X, Y coordinates that map the tree within the plot. And we also measured every sapling within the plot, um, but we did not, did not map those. Um, so we did live and dead trees. We also collected data within the 30 one by one meter quadrats. That's where we measured seedlings, um, density, and size class. And we also measured percent um, bryophyte uh, ground cover. We measured um, coarse woody material along turkey foot transects. So these are um, 10 by 10 or 10 meter transects laid out in kind of the same piece sign and then repeated every 25 meters down the plot. Those are these here. And then we also measured soil depth every 10 meters down the center of the plot as well. And finally, we collected uh, 30 increment cores from each site from uh, 30 randomly selected red spruce trees, and we stratified those by diameter. So we tried to get the same number of, say, um, trees between one, between 10 and 20 centimeters diameter, and then 20 and 30, et cetera. So kind of 
get a, a range of tree sizes. So here's some photos of us doing field work. Um, it was great to be out in the park. Um, so this field work happened in, in the in 2020, so we're still kind of shut down with the pandemic. Um, Sean always liked me to point out this um, really perfectly straight tape. <laughs> yeah. he, uh, he laid that out, of course. So <laughs> this is an easy one. The laying out the tapes at Western Mountain was not, that's mm -hmm. Blackwoods. Um, not that easy, but they were equally straight. <laughs> um, this is right, so I mentioned that we collected tree cores. So there's me in the upper right, upper left, excuse me, collecting tree cores. You'll notice that we collect them at rest height. So um, the tree core starts essentially when the individual reached that height. So that'll become important later. But we did collect 280 cores, as Marie knows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and once they're collected, they dry, and then you mount them in these wooden mounts in the center. They get polished, like sanded to a fine polish, and then I scan them at high resolution. Again, thank you, Marie, for the use of your scanner. Um, so about uh, 2,400 DPI was my, my average. Um, and then I used a software program called Coup Recorder to measure each ring width and assign years. Okay. Um, so we had two purposes in collecting the tree cores. We wanted to generate age structures for each site as well as disturbance chronologies. And in order to do that, uh, you have to make sure you're assigning the correct year to each ring. Um, and that's not quite as straightforward as you might think, um, because red spruce and many other species do not always put on a full ring of growth every year. And that's because the cambium, which is sort of the, the active life part of the tree bark, um, doesn't grow evenly. And if it's a poor growing year, it might not grow at all. So you end up with missing rings um, or, or sort of partial rings. So if you look here on the left, it's very hard to see, but this ring 107, excuse me, it sort of starts out and then it sort of blends into the ring before it. And so if we had poured the tree at a different place, we wouldn't have caught that ring at all and it would have been a missing ring. And so what you do is you compare um, the ring width patterns of an individual core to the ring width patterns of all the rest of the trees in that area that you've collected. And using statistical analysis, um, you can get probable areas where you're, you're missing rings. And then you can go back to your increment core and look and see, does that actually make sense on the core? So with our, um, with the cross-dated tree, um, tree ring series, we then wanted to analyze each core for evidence of past disturbance in order to generate that disturbance chronology. So this is a figure of um, an individual tree um, and growth patterns. On the y-axis, you can see you have ring width, and then on the x-axis, you just have a year, decade. And um, so we're, lo we're looking for evidence of a canopy disturbance through a change in growth rate in the tree rings. So you can imagine that this period of growth is suppressed, right? There's barely any growth, it's very close to zero. Um, the tree was probably overtopped by some larger tree and it had suppressed growth. Then you've got this growth release that this is the sustained um, large magnitude increase in that growth. It's abrupt as well. And so you can interpret that as there being a canopy disturbance um, prior to that growth release and the increase in light or the decrease in competition allowed the tree to, to grow faster. Another possible pattern that would indicate a canopy disturbance is um, if the core, the tree core starts out growing quite rapidly and then tails off. And this is an example of a gap of fruit. And that's that you would get that pattern if um, the canopy disturbance happened 
while the individual was still a seedling or sapling, so below the height at which we core the tree. And so it gets a lot of light, starts growing really quickly, it's growing quickly when it reaches the height that we core the tree, and then the canopy closes above it and the tree growth um, you know, decreases again. So that's what happened on this floor. Um, there was a, a disturbance, it made it to breast height, then it was suppressed for like 80 years, mm -hmm. and then there was another canopy disturbance, and then um, it was able to probably make it to the canopy. Okay, so that's everything on study design. We're gonna head into the results now. So this figure shows overstory composition at all the sites. You can see them all lined up and it compares the uh, the tree composition in the 1959 visit to the 2020s visit. Um, so the main thing I want to point out is that red spruce is, is this green color and um, it is the most uh, abundant tree species at all the sites and it maintained its dominance across the 60 year time period. And in fact, it uh, increased its percent basal area at all the sites except for Pematic Mountain where there was an increase in the basal area of um, hemlock. Interestingly, there's not really that much fir at these sites. You know, you often think of this, the spruce fir forest, um, but along the coast, they really seem to be spruce forests with like a small component of fir. Um, you'll also probably notice this, this pink is white spruce. There's quite a lot of white spruce um, in 1959 at Bass Harbor and on point, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Yes. Is there okay. Yeah. The other conifer are those probably like cedar or more like other pines? Um, it's cedar for the most part. There was also a little bit of white pine on some of the sites. Um, yeah. yeah, that's probably yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Yes. So now we'll look at the regeneration layers. This is the same figure, but now we've got saplings on top and seedlings on the bottom. So again, uh, red spruce was the most abundant species in the regeneration layer. It, the regeneration layer is much more variable than the tree canopy though. There was more fir in the sapling layer. You can see the, the dark blue than there was in the canopy, but it decreased over the 60 year time period. That's weird. That was so the white spruce are coming back at Bass Harbor Head. Is that what I was oh, seeing there? In the sapling, sapling yeah. yeah. Sapling layer. And there's some in the sapling layer. Yes, we'll get to that. Yeah. We'll um, I remember that also from the MacArthur study. The big, the yeah, the well, MacArthur said that they were all white spruce, but <laughs> they went back. He was like, did he just misidentify them? Yeah, I was yeah. glad to talk to. But I heard that from Bick because you saw yeah. saw that there, yeah. right, with the trees. Yeah, I was worried that was misidentified. <laughs> yeah. Nope, it's not just me, and I double checked. Um, but yes, so but we we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, well, right now actually, but so this is a graph of percent relative change of a species with the same um, tree growth stages. So the, the black is tree, and we've got saplings and seedlings. Um, it's percent relative change. So if a bar is above that zero midline, there is an increase in the species over the time period. If the bar is below the midline, there is a decrease. And it's not important that we look at all of them, you know, in detail, but the main thing I want to point out is that most sites did not have a lot of change in composition. So you look at Blackwoods, it's basically no composition. Beach Mountain as well, particularly in the tree layer, very little change. Um, there's a little bit more in the in the regeneration layer, except at Bass Harbor, not a point um, where the white spruce component, quite a large white spruce component in 1959, was almost completely replaced by red spruce across the same time period. So, why did that happen? <laughs> there was a large disturbance at both sites 
in the intervening 60 years. This is uh, historical imagery from a uh, point site. The one on the left is from 1956, so before it was sampled by Dr. Davis, and then 1966 um, after it was sampled. And you can see the, the plot in yellow, and then in 1966, there's this, I outlined it a bit, it's a little hard to see, but um, there's this large blowdown that occurred. Um, and this was a storm or a series of storms in the early 60s that blew down um, a lot of trees on the headland. Yeah. There was a big hurricane in 61 with explosive tag. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what it is. And, and Dr. Davis notes it in um, his 1966 publication. They went back to visit and it had been blown down. Yeah. Um, so we can take another a closer look at the composition of these two sites, which are both, you know, very close to the ocean. They're on exposed headlands. Um, you can see the tree layer. 959 had a lot of white spruce, and then when we went to visit in the 2020s, very little white spruce. There was just a tiny bit of best harbor, but it's completely gone at a point. Um, and if you look at the regeneration layer in 959, so for saplings, it's these two bars and then um, seedlings, these ones, there's very little white spruce in the regeneration layer. It's red spruce and fir. And that is what we got in the canopy after the disturbance occurred. And the reason why we had those species in the regeneration in the first place is because they're uh, shade tolerant species and they're able to persist under a canopy for decades. And white spruce is not as shade tolerant. Um, so at Otter Point today, well, I haven't been down actually since the last big storms. <laughs> <laughs> but when I sampled it, there's a closed canopy there. And so um, it's still quite shady in the understory, and we still only have red spruce and fir in the understory there. But the situation is a little different at Bass Harbor Head. There, there were semi open conditions for decades, and that allowed white spruce to recruit back into the sapling layer. And actually, there's a couple trees small trees. And so if there was another large disturbance at Bass Harbor Head now, we could see more white spruce making it back into the canopy at this point, which we would not expect at all. Um, so to, we used a non-metric multidimensional scaling ordination to sort of summarize the composition results. And um, an ordination is a technique in which the similarity or dissimilarity between data points is expressed as the distance between points. So similar points will be close together on the graph. And you can see that composition at these sites has become closer over time. We've got the light green dots are the site visits from 1959, and they're connected with an arrow to, to their visit in the 2020s. And so most of the sites and visits are clustered in this one in a corner here that's dominated by red spruce. And you can see the Bass Harbor and Otter Point sites in 1959. They're just similar. They're far away from that cluster. And then they move closer to all the rest of the sites compositionally over time. The one um, exception, again, is the Pemetic Mountain site, which starts out quite different and then moves even farther away. It's got this hemlock component that isn't really found at the other sites. Okay, so that's it for forest composition. We're going to move into forest structure now. Okay, so um, this is Sean's favorite figure, I think. <laughs> it's, uh, essentially, these are uh, tree maps for each site. So we've got each site lined up. And it's essentially the plot. So this is zero to 10 meters on the x-axis and then zero to 200 meters on the y-axis. Obviously not to scale. It, it really, you can't see anything to scale. Um, but the dots are trees. So live trees are in green. Um, gray trees are, are dead. And the size of the dot corresponds to the diameter of the tree. And they're mapped on top of sapling density. So the darker blue 
the more saplings there were in that particular part of the farm. So we just spent a lot of time here, but the main thing I want to point out is that there's high site to site variability. So if we look at the Otter Point site, there's really dense, small trees. And then um, you can just compare that to the Beach Mountain site that's right next door. Um, there's a very low density of comparatively larger trees. I do want to point out the Western Mountain sites. Again, this was our old growth site. This had uh, low tree density with a range of size classes. So you can see small trees and large trees. And then there's very dense patches of saplings sort of scattered throughout the site. But interestingly, you can see a similar pattern at uh, Ironbound, Beach Mountain, and also Bass Harbor Head, that like low density, larger trees um, with lots of saplings. So another way to look at the range of size classes is with a diameter distribution. So um, these are just density of trees in each of these diameter size classes. And again, you can see there's a lot of variability in the range of distribution shapes um, at the sites, and then also in how they shifted from the, what they look like in the first visit versus the, our visit six years later. So for instance, Ironbound and Western Mountain really didn't change very much. It's quite a similar distribution. Um, but if you look at Otter Point, which again had that big disturbance, um, the, the shape changed quite a bit. So there weren't very many small trees in 1959, and now we've got a ton that's actually negative exponential distribution. Right. So before we continue our discussion of structural change, I wanted to address there's this perennial concern with resampling historic sites, and that is, are the differences you're seeing in the data actually temporal change, or is it just because there's space variation of the site and you put the plot in the wrong place um, or it's a different size, right? So we are very confident that we relocated the correct sites, but we have no idea where those 10 by 10 meter inventory plots fell within that site. So you can imagine what would our data look like if Davis's 10 by 10 meters fell you know, in this orientation? Or perhaps they were like this in our plot, or like this, and would we get different results? So to get at this question, we simulated the spatial variation across our 10 by 200 meter plot. Uh, we subsampled it five times in the same sort of um, study design as Dr. Davis. So we did five 10 by 10 meter plots and just took them out of our large plot. And so this is what we ended up with. So the violin itself here is the simulated distribution. And then on top of that, we've got the actual densities for um, our whole plot. The whole 10 by 200 meter plot is in the, the dark green circles. Um, and then the density reported in 1959 are in the light green triangles. So you can look at our point site and the 959 density falls way outside of our simulated distribution. And so we can interpret that as there is a large change in tree density over the same time period. The density report in 959 is not found anywhere on the plot in the 2020s. And you can contrast that to the Bass Harbor Head site where you know the densities are different. There's the change in density value, but you can still find um, the 959 density, those characteristics, they're still found on the plot today. So it's not the same magnitude of change that you can see at Otter Point. And then also three other sites, um, Beach Mountain, Pemtech, and Blackwoods, the 959 density fell outside of um, our simulated distribution. We also simulated tree basal area, but basal area does not highlight structural differences as well as density because um, you can have two plots with you know, diametric structural characteristics and they might have the same basal area. So if you had a plot with a high density of small trees, that might be the same basal area as a plot with just a few big trees. So we didn't see a dramatic change, but overall five sites decreased in, in basal area. 
So to summarize our results in uh, forest st structure change, um, we saw high site-to-site -site and interest site variability. And the structural metrics of some sites, namely Bass Harborhead, Beach Mountain, and Ironbound, are now within published ranges for old growth sites, particularly what we're comparing to is Big Reedy in Northern Maine, but also we're very similar to our Western Mountain site. Um, in particular, metrics I'm thinking of are they have relatively low tree density um, with some larger trees, <coughs> high sapling density, a well-developed bryophyte ground cover, um, and high levels of standing and fallen dead wood. And so to state that differently, those sites are now difficult to distinguish from the old growth that we have remaining on the landscape. Okay, so now gotten through our first and second objectives, which were to assess um, the current structure and composition and quantify the changes over the sampling period. So now we're going to move into the age structure and disturbance chronology results. So this is a figure of the recruitment age structures for each site. And I want to emphasize the recruitment age, like we talked about, not germination age. So the ages reported here are when the trees reached breast height, not when they germinated. So here we included the tree cores that um, we collected in the 2020s. They're in the dark green, but we also collected Dr. Davis's course that he collected in 1959. Those are in the light green. Uh, and he also collected some white spruce cores. It's like we said, there was a lot of white spruce um, at Otter Point and Bass Harbor Head. So you'll see those there too. So the biggest takeaway from these age structures um, <clears throat> are that five of the seven sites show a really strong initial single cohort structure in the mid 1800s. So you can see that right here, there's this big pulse of recruitment in this is sort of the late 1800s of the site. But here at Blackwoods, Hematic Mountain, Beach Mountain, Iron Mountain all have this strong pulse of recruitment. So the Bass Harbor Head site, we know was a pasture before a field of the field. And that's one of the reasons why we have white spruce there. Um, it's a really good um, old field successional species. But we'll put that aside for now. The other four sites, the pad, this recruitment pattern um, is consistent with recruitment post harvesting. And this corresponds with the extensive harvesting that was happening throughout Maine in the mid 1800s well, the whole age hundreds, as well as on MDI. So um, some people might interpret this recruitment pattern as post-fire, but we really think that uh, harvesting is a much more plausible explanation, particularly because we picked up these, uh, a small number of trees that predate the large recruitment peaks. So you can see that at Blackwoods, um, Beach Mountain also has a few ahead of the main recruitment and projected Iron Brown Island. And so if this is harvesting, um, these trees would have been small saplings, small trees that wouldn't have been harvested. Um, and they would have survived the harvest and then recruited into the canopy. If it had been fire, um, they would have been highly uh, susceptible to, to, to burning because they have thin bark and they're small stature. So if there had been fire, we almost certainly would not have found um, these older trees. The one exception is possibly Pemantic Mountain. So as we didn't find um, any remnant trees there, but that also corresponds with a well-documented um, large fire that started at the Jordan Sawmill in 1864, which is quite close to um, the site. There was obviously a lot of harvesting happening in that area because there was a hard, well, there was a sawmill, um, but it may have burned before it was harvested, or it was harvested and burned. We don't really know, but um, there could have been a fire at that site. Um, so returning to Bass Harbor and Otter Point, um, we've got two cohorts at this stand. 
in this age structure, but the first one is mostly made up of Dr. Davis's cores. And there were very few of those trees left when we went to sample. And in fact, we only picked up a couple trees from that cohort. And that's the cohort that um, was blown down in between sampling events. And most of our cores come from this younger um, recruitment pulse that happened after Dr. Davis sampled. And so that was predominantly wind disturbance that um, affected those sites and wind also played a large role at the Western Mountain site, but we'll return to that on its own in a little bit. So I wanted to just give a few pictures of um, lumbering on MDI. This is the Soamsville sawmill. Um, looking in Soamsville. This was the, a, a sawmill that was there for quite a long time but it was destroyed by fire in 1933. And then uh, in the bottom, Right, there's a photo of a log shoot above the Seal Cove Bridge. There were sawmills all over the island, and I particularly want to thank Catherine Schmidt for sharing her research with me. Um, and I'm excited to hear more about her research. But there is certainly a lot of lumbering happening on the island, as well as throughout Maine during this period. All right, so we're going to talk about the disturbance chronology next. So I just want to remind you all of how we collected the data for that. Um, and it's from uh, examining each core for evidence of disturbance. So here are disturb the disturbance chronologies for the four sites with that mid-1800s post-harvest um, recruitment. And so you can see that these pulses, uh, pulses of gap recruits line up with those recruitment pulses. And that is further evidence that um, the sites had open canopies at that time. All these trees were growing, they were small saplings and seedlings, and they were growing really quickly when they reached breast height because there was no canopy above them because it had been harvested. Um, the century following that, the 1900s, uh, mostly just had um, sporadic growth releases, and this is evidence likely of, of small gaps created by windstorms. Um, that the, the trees already present on the site were taking advantage of. Uh, these are the disturbance chronologies for Bass Harbor and Otter Point. And here you can really see the um, disturbances that happened at Otter Point in the early 1960s. There's a big pulse of gap recruits because almost that whole stand was blown down. Um, but in contrast, the Bass Harbor head site the disturbance is really picked up in the mid uh, 1970s, and there's some sort of elevated disturbance for a couple decades afterwards. So, wind disturbance likely played a role here, but there was also probably um, pest disturbance, either hemlock looper, that was um, lots of reports of hemlock looper in that area, and also possibly spruce budworm, though that evidence is a little um, more tenuous. But both those pests affect white spruce more than red spruce, so it checks out. So I did want to spend a few moments just on Western Mountain. Again, that was our only remaining old growth and the age structure for Western Mountain is just really unique compared to all of our other sites. There's recruitment in nearly every decade. Um, and in the disturbance chronology, you can see there's low to moderate severity canopy disturbances likely due to windstorms um, across that, we have almost a 300 year um, chronology. The only real evidence is, uh, or exception to that, is there's this pulse of disturbance in the 1920s, and this corresponds to a spruce budworm outbreak that was well documented throughout Maine. Um, but overall, this disturbance regime was dominated by small scale canopy gaps. Okay, so that takes me to sort of the conclusions and the future directions of the study. So, the main conclusion and the main takeaway that I'd like you leave, to leave you with is that we saw signs of resilience in these red spruce forests. Red spruce is still the dominant species um, across the 60 years. There's abundant advanced regeneration of red spruce, 
And even with disturbance, there was no conversion to another species. We also saw recovery from mid 1800s harvest at most of our sites. And the structure and composition of some of the sites is starting to resemble the remaining old growth that we have on the landscape. Um, and also the forest structure is driven by low to moderate wind disturbance. That's the main disturbance agent. Um, and that's led to high site to site variability. These sites can serve as a model for other coastal spruce forests. The structural and compositional trajectories may predict how other coastal spruce forests mature because they were selected as examples of the most mature forests on the landscape. So chronologically, they're ahead of the most of the red spruce population. But this is a caveat in the absence of major climate change. Um, yeah. <laughs> however, however, the advancing maturity may be a benefit under an uncertain climate, um, largely because large old forests are reservoirs of genetic diversity and reproductive fitness, all of that advanced regeneration that we see here in Acadia. Um, they support a great diversity of bryophytes and lichens and saprophytic species. Um, and they may provide just through their character um, resilience to climate change. So better than other parts of the state of that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to end on some future directions. I think we probably have more questions now than we did at the beginning, which is how all those, those good projects go. Um, but the next logical step is to connect these seven sites to the larger coastal spruce population. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this work was undertaken thanks to a second century stewardship fellowship that was granted to uh, Dr. Jay Wason. So Jay and other investigators that are listed there have recently secured additional funds to expand the objectives to the entire main coast. And so these sites can serve as important benchmarks for comparison. But uh, closer to home, we could compare these sites to the largest spruce population in Acadia by using my programs, North East Temper Network's um, randomly located forest monitoring plots. And that could give us new insights into the developmental trajectories of Acadia's iconic spruce forests. Um, we also limited the tree ring analysis for the study just on age structures and um, stand dynamics, and we didn't address climate sensitivity. Um, which has been addressed in detail in other environments, but really not along the coast. They, coastal spruce may respond differently um, to different climate stressors because they're in a, simply in a different environment with, with different important climate variables. So a better understanding of um, climate sensitivity of coastal spruce will help our projections of um, their growth under different climate scenarios. But before we can get into climate growth relationships, you have to identify any like um, non-climate related growth reductions, so specifically pests and diseases. Um, I mentioned spruce bugworm before, that's really well documented in northern Maine, Canada, but the evidence of spruce bugworm outbreaks on the coast is limited and um, kind of inconclusive. So um, in Maine, northern Maine, there's five well-documented major um, spruce bugworm outbreaks. We only found evidence of the 1920s outbreak and only at two sites. So um, this really re requires more study to, be, um, to, to determine how big of an impact spruce bugworm has had um, in the past on coastal spruce forests. And then finally, um, hope that these sites will be monitored uh, into the future um, and become uh, an important stuff here. Um, an important benchmark um, for coastal spruce change. All right. Uh, thank you all for, for listening. I'd like to thank um, the UMaine School of Ecology and Environmental Sciences program as well as the School of Forest Resources. Um, the Northeast Temperate Network and Swedish Institute provided funding for this research. But most importantly, I'd like to thank Dr. Ron Davis, who, who um, whose landmark study 60 years ago made this, this work possible today.
Um, but thank you all for for listening. Are you, are you stronger from doing all the coring and <laughs> dance, <laughs> high stepping and diameter yeah, measuring? I mean, <laughs> coring spruce is a dream, yeah, you know? It's like I butter. I enjoy coring spruce a lot better than, <laughs> than oaks. So. But yeah, so it's a big part of the project. <laughs> Is our islands smaller islands like if you look at Iron Bound, which is really coastal, but like Idaho, I mean, I, 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 more distant islands like this, there's just is that history different or yeah, um, there on the outer islands, there is more white spruce in general, um, partially because of that. A higher rate of disturbance if you can get longer periods of open conditions mm -hmm. which um, facilitate that white spruce colonization also white spruce is even more cold adapted than than red spruce and so i think it does better out further into the ocean um so you do tend to find more white spruce out there than than red spruce Ilaho is interesting because there seems to be a hybrid sort of between black spruce and red spruce out there. So I think there's a lot of research that can be done on the outer islands. I think, you know, they're logistically challenging to get out there. So that's probably why um, there hasn't been as much work done out there. But I think there are a lot of questions that could be asked about how those forests are different from what we see on these larger, large islands and then in the moment. Is that a commonly noted thing that the spruce budworm doesn't uh, hit the coast as hard in Canada, where maybe they have, I don't know, do they have better monitoring along the coast? Um, I don't no. know so much. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because I've read a lot of the, you know, the old reports um, from the 1980s spruce budworm and just in Maine, a lot of just the monitoring was focused in Northern Maine. I don't know if it's just because that was economically more important. <laughs> you know, that's where um and along the coast. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um but yeah, the records are much less specific. Um, there was a lot of spraying on this island yeah. in the 50s. I don't remember. From the superintendent's reports that I looked at, whether it was a spruce budworm, but it was just about everything else. So you could just get to the lot and saw fly and yeah. um, all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested, yeah. there are reports. Was there very great that you could peruse through and see yeah. if they spray at the same. So. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, the spring might be better documented than yeah. the reasons why they were spraying in the first place. Yeah. Uh, the defoliation, um, but there was definitely reports of defoliation in, from the 1980s outbreak, you know, in coastal Maine. It's just, it's just not as much detail as what they've got in the county. I'd be interested in hearing you talk a little bit about the diversity of the bryophytes that you found on the ground underneath yeah. these various forests and whether they were incredibly diverse or what did they look like? Because I can picture at least one site that's pretty remarkable, and that's Ironbound. If you have the sample mm -hmm. in some of the of the areas where the, the mosses are just you know, mm -hmm. you know a foot deep. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And uh, Dr. Davis did inventory to species all the bryophytes, but I did not. <laughs> I just did for sign yeah. cover. Um, I did sphagnum and non sphagnum, but. But generally, I didn't. I didn't do species, but that is an important. Yeah, if you wanted to look at microsites um, and diversity of lichens, um, that are and and, and bryophytes, it is correlated with older forests because you start to get more of that pit and mound um, topography and those microsites and that. Um, yeah, just provides a range of of site conditions which 
promotes more species instead of like one or two species, which you can see. So yeah, I would I did look at it, but I'd expect um, while Blackwoods had and has, if you go down to Blackwoods, it's just a really amazing blanket of moss. It's almost like I can go look at it. Oh, actually, I should have it here. Um, yeah. So Blackwoods here. It has 32% cover of bryophytes in 1959 and shot all the way up to 84. But I imagine that there's fewer species there because it's quite yeah. uniform. I mean, there's, there aren't rock outcroppings and things like that. Um, but compared to and iron, iron bottom, field, too. Iron bottom is quite, and iron bottom is the wettest site, so that might be a confounding group. Yeah. But Western Mountain is down, but I'd expect maybe there's more um, species diversity. At Western Mountain than at Blackwoods, but I can't back it up. That well, it's more, a more open forest, if I remember what you were saying. There are more gaps. Yeah, and Western there's Mountain. more fallen wood, you know, yeah. you've got all the stumps, you know, the stump environment's very different than the ground. I also found that I didn't, this is more just hypothesis, but where you have that really dense, like sapling regeneration, there tends to be pretty sparse moss underneath that. So I wonder if you have these waves of regeneration with those gaps that come and go, like your bryophyte cover mm -hmm. also kind of transitions with it. But that's all completely conjecture. So. Hi, Camila. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Ron. How are you? Fine. How are you? Great. I, wanna, I, I just want to make a, a comment uh, to uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I think we're all indebted to you. And um, uh, I never thought when I carried out this study uh, as a graduate student at Cornell uh, that anyone would be resampling my stands uh, some 65 years later. Uh, so I am very indebted to you and uh, you did a fine job. Uh, the methods you used were superior to mine. Uh, the uh, uh, Ecological sampling of forests has come a long way uh, since I first did that work. Uh, I just want to mention a, a minor point uh, regarding uh, the coring of uh, trees uh, in these forests, uh, red spruce in particular, which is so tolerant of shade. Uh, if the tree started out as a suppressed tree, uh, coring it at uh, breast height can lose as many as 50 years of growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Thanks again. No, thank you so much, Ron. That's, that's wonderful to hear. And I'm, I'm so pleased to be part of um, this history and hopefully into the future, these sites will um, continue to be sampled. But, uh, but yeah, that's a really good point um, about the recruitment versus the germination age. I think, um, I think Sean's on, on here, but I think Sean, was that 80 years possibly that was your record? But anyway, spruce can live in the understory for a really long time and has a suppressed seedling. Um, so the and fact- What were some of the oldest trees you cored? Um, the oldest, oh God, I, I studied this before my defense because I knew someone was going to ask me, nobody did, and now Charlie is trying to remember. Um, I think he was 273 at Ironbound. Yeah, I remember your graph there that it looked like it went back to the late 1700s, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think I um, think I'm back to it. But, yeah, thank you. I don't know why I can here. So in general, this seems like really good news for spruce in the yeah. park, right? Yeah, I mean, right now we don't have any warning signs. I would say. So I, I have kind of a question, like related to that, and, mm -hmm. and where we might get into warning, new warning signs, or maybe known warning signs that amplify. But um, and remind me. So I think when you said the pemetic site was the only one that you thought potentially had fire as a possible disturbance component. Yes, and uh, that's not to say there's no fire at all. There is, and um, Ron documented this in his thesis, which is great reading, that there's charcoal in the 
soil layer, a lot of these mm -hmm. sites. Um, but there was a lot, so there was harvesting going on. There's a lot of fire associated with lumbering operations and the slash piles and the stuff mm -hmm. going on. So, um, you know, and, and fire is an important part of this landscape. But as far as the, um, like a stand placing fire, yeah. there's not evidence of that in any of the sites except that possibly tempted. And so I'm trying to think like if, you know, these are examples of these resilient mm -hmm. sites where spruce maintains its, you know, dominance and and, and the characteristic of, of, of the forest remains through a whole bunch of different disturbances, frequencies and whatnot. So I guess what I'm wondering what you just maybe just sort of thoughts if like if we get into a future where let's say warmer and drier environment at certain times of year that maybe there's more fires or something like that. Um, would we, would you anticipate that we still will see spruce as dominant on that? Or is that meaning that if it's a standard placing thing that, you know, there'd be change in the, because you also saw no real difference, difference in composition right now. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if, you know, I'm just trying to get a sense of what you're thinking of like, a threshold or a turning point where we could get into a future of certain types of disturbances and pests can be part of that too, where mm -hmm. spruce is no longer the death dominant. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the red spruce, I think, perpetuates itself. Um, like a lot of that is based on this advanced regeneration layer of spruce seedlings that we have them so healthy here in Acadia right now. Um, they don't seem that great at colonizing like new here. So, like if you look at a study done um, in Canada about uh, red spruce colonizing old fields, and it doesn't mm. do that very well. White spruce does, but red spruce doesn't. Seems like it does really well, like under it. You know, it just uh, makes itself. So, if you had a situation like a Fire again, though it did, you know, red spruce came back after the fire 47. Not in this study, if you look at our, um, you know, any tan data, it's coming back in those areas, but it's taking quite a while. Um, so, if you, I could imagine that would be the hardest thing for it to come back from yeah. if you, if all of the red spruce from an area was made, like from all the size mixes, that would be difficult. But if you take the canopy out, and if there's you know regeneration on the ground, it seems to be able to um, recover. Right? So if there's a huge amount of wind bro. So it seems fine. If it's on the ground, it's okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I mean, and and fallen trees, you know, that those are nurse logs potentially. They're great places for spruce to regenerate. But I think about what's happening out on Eastern Head. But maybe I don't know if you know what's happening out there, but it, the forest is largely gone, mm -hmm. and it's raspberries and pumper brush and nasty yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, that, so, <clears throat> yes. When I've been out there, it was, I think it was predominantly white spruce out there, which kind of makes sense. You got the idea yeah. uh, of one areas. <clears throat> but um, there are a set of, like shrubby and herbaceous species that um, have been sort of identified globally as uh, impeding tree regeneration. And so like raspberries are on there. Um, <clears throat> um, bracken ferns on there too. They're basically species that create really dense sort of shaded environments that can then prevent you know, tree regeneration from coming up. And so those persistent open conditions out there have maybe promoted, you know, raspberry a little too much. Raspberry loves open conditions, you know, and yeah, but that's, you know, again, it's one of those exposed headlands that gets a lot of wind disturbance. And maybe if the wind disturbance comes too frequently, um, you know, the forest canopy cover is not able to, to regenerate. Yeah, but I haven't out there in a while. Sorry. I wonder, uh, this is Ron again. Uh, I wonder if um, with increased windiness and, and storminess uh, in our future that uh, the relative abundance of red and white spruce might shift. Uh, certainly um, 
uh, red spruce, uh, which is the most abundant species in coastal Maine, uh, spruce fir forest, um, is uh, very important and you've uh, appropriately focused on it. Uh, white spruce is more unique to this latitude, especially heavy growth of white spruce as occurs on some islands and tips of peninsulas, especially in eastern Maine. And um, so uh, perhaps uh, given the uh, uh, dependence uh, of white spruce on more open conditions for regeneration, uh, perhaps uh, there will be a shift in the future as a result of storminess. Yeah, maybe that's positive to look forward to right. know, spruce um, getting an edge, but probably again along, along the coast. Yeah. I just want to be mindful of time. Um, we're a little past one, but thank you very much, Camilla. This mm -hmm. was awesome, and congratulations you. on getting your uh, on getting your master's. This was great work. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So you're starting PhD program? <laughs> <laughs>